Hello there, guys. I'm sure that by this point, many of you have heard of the, for lack of a better word, scandal, I guess, surrounding Nikki Philippi. I might be destroying her last name, but I've seen people pronounce it numerous ways. I'm not going to go into grisly detail on that issue tonight because one, a lot of creators have already discussed it at length and you can look up their videos to see it in greater detail. And two, the amount of trigger warnings that would have to go into that are just too numerous to even wrap my mind around. And I don't want to sit here traumatizing people all night long. <laughs> However, listening to the reason people are so upset with her and with her husband for what they did with regards to their dog brought something to mind that is a topic I've wanted to talk about pretty much since I first started this channel, but it's one of those topics that is very tricky to talk about because everyone is going to have a very strong opinion. Some people will strongly agree with everything I say and some people will strongly disagree and get upset over pretty much everything I have to say. And I want to let you know right now ahead of time that by no means am I saying I'm an absolute expert and you should just do everything that I say and I'm the only one who's ever right about these things. I'm simply speaking as someone with over a decade of experience in animal rescue and I'm speaking on my own personal life experiences with animal rescue. I'm going to try to help people understand where some people have gone wrong. And the reason I wanted to talk about this now is because the majority of animals that I rescued are farm animals. And a lot of people come around June, June through about August. That tends to be like peak season for people suddenly deciding that even if they've only lived in the city or the suburb their entire life, they just saw, you know, a cute baby goat or something, so they're going to have a farm. <laughs> and obviously, as someone who cares very much about animals, I absolutely want people to be enthusiastic about rescuing them and getting them out of a bad situation. And I'd always rather have an animal go to a loving home, even if they, you know, get things a little bit wrong here and there, than stay in a situation that is dangerous for the animal. So, as I mentioned, when I was about 13, I started rescuing farm animals. I'd been a 4-H kid, I'd lived in the country since I was six years old, and my parents didn't even let me consider taking care of anything other than a cat or a dog until I had proven with my hard work and, you know, education and everything that I had to know for 4-H that I could absolutely care for these animals properly. They made sure I understood that this was going to be my life now, that I wasn't always going to get to go to a sleepover or go on a summer vacation with my friends and stuff because if there was no one to care for the animals, they were my animals and my responsibility. They were really drilling all this into my head that this is a life, this is not an accessory. You can't just say, I don't feel like dealing with it today and pony off on somebody else, you know? It's your responsibility to deal with because you are the one who made the choice to take it home. And no one gets it perfect. No one gets it right all the time. Even if you are someone who is like third, fourth, fifth generation farmer or animal rescuer in your family, you're going to make mistakes here and there. It just happens. Human error occurs, um, especially when you're dealing with exotic animals, which is what most of mine were. These were animals that for the most part, a lot of veterinarians who called would go, uh... I don't really know how to help you with that. And the nearest veterinarian that could perform serious surgeries and stuff on them was like three and a half hours away from our house. So basically, you had to make sure 
that before you obtain these animals from wherever they were coming from, that you knew you could care for it no matter what because you were probably going to have to either spend a ton of money getting the animal to where it needed for surgery or you were going to just have to inherently know what to do, you know, in terms of every avenue leading up to that and surgery or driving it that far was a last resort to save its life. And this is something a lot of people weren't ready for. Something that a lot of people didn't understand when I was growing up was why in the world did I have the animals that I had? Why did I choose to rescue the ones like llamas and goats and <laughs> ducks that were like really specific breeds and stuff? And they were, especially with the llamas, they're just like, I don't get it. Like it's, it's basically a useless animal. Like you're just wasting your money on this thing. It's like, no, actually they're extremely useful animals. There is no such thing as a useless animal. You just have to understand how to interact with it, how to find what its uses are, what it's good at. We tended to bring in a decent amount of money with fiber arts that we would get from our llamas. And we would have, you know, Girl Scout troops come out and visit them, or we would take them to fairs or to, you know, people's, you know, private petting zoos and everything. Like there were a lot of different ways we brought in money with them to pay for their care. And unfortunately, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, people who wanted to either visit our animals, our farm, our rescue farm, or people who wanted us to visit them wanted it to be done in the summer months, usually between June and August, because it's really nice weather for the most part. Yeah, you've got your hot days in there and everything, but for the most part, it's going to be sunny, it's going to be nice, kids are going to be feeling energetic and want to hang out with them and learn about them. So that's when most of this stuff went down. And I can't... I can't count the amount of times a grown adult in front of these small children would approach us and say, oh my goodness, I think that after visiting you or you visiting us, I'm just going to go and get llamas or something or get goats because they're so cute. They're so sweet. I love yours. They're so well behaved. And look at them. They're just like out there grazing and stuff. They're so easy to take care of. This is wonderful. And sometimes you could tell, you know, the person which is enthusiastic and excited about the experience they had but other times people were absolutely serious when they were saying this they absolutely meant every word of i'm going and getting an animal and the reason you would figure that out is that they would whip out their phones and just immediately start looking up llamas for sale in the area or something and we were like stop and they always looked so shocked when we would ask them to cease just quit looking it up do not buy them and they're just like well i don't understand like you're telling us these stories about how you've rescued them and how good that feels how fulfilling it is to know that you saved an innocent creature's life from you know a horrible existence wherever it was why would you not want us to do the same thing and it was like that's not the problem. What the problem is, is that up until today, you had only seen these animals online. <laughs> like, this was your first in-person experience with them. Ours are well-behaved for a couple of reasons. One reason they're so well-behaved is because of the fact that we spent years and years training them. Another reason is because the weather is very nice right now. They're just out there relaxing in the sun, so they have no reason to be snarky. You haven't seen them on days that, you know, they have like a PTSD moment and they get upset because like, for example, one of ours had had trauma at the hands of a man who happened to be wearing a hat. Every time someone set foot on our farm, if they had a hat on, she would freak out until they took the hat off and had it out of sight. They have triggers just like humans do. I'm like, you haven't seen any of them when they're triggered by something. You didn't see them when they first got here. You don't see them when they just decide they're having a crappy day and they want to take it out on you. You are seeing them 
on a warm summer day, when they're in a terrific mood because the weather is nice, when they're getting a bunch of attention from people, so they're loving that, obviously, they're getting extra snacks that they normally wouldn't be getting. And of course, it's kind of easy to take care of them today because you're just seeing them, you know, grazing on the field. You've been here for, what, an hour out of the entire day? You didn't see that we've had to come out three times already. Three hours of our day have already been spent out here making sure that all of them were shorn down because with the heat where they live, if you don't shear them in time, they're going to have heat stroke. We had one that had multiple heat strokes before we obtained him because of the person that he lived with before. You didn't see that when they were panting because they couldn't handle the heat even though they're shorn, we had to go and cool them off one by one. Catch them, put their leads on them, hold them steady while you're trying to cool them off and make sure they're doing okay. You didn't see how many times we've had to run back out here and refill their water to make sure they stay hydrated. You haven't seen what's going to happen later on tonight when it's time to bring them back into the barn for the evening and they don't want to leave that field. So they make you run laps around an entire field like 10 times before you can get them in. <laughs> you haven't seen the winter time when you have to hold thick rubber buckets, heavy buckets that are filled with ice over your head and smash them on the ground to get the ice out so you can refill it and trying to heat up the water pump because the well is frozen. Like you're seeing the best case scenario. And sometimes that was enough to kind of make them go, ooh, well, maybe I should learn a little bit more before I do this and sometimes they would try to argue with us of course because they absolutely know better than the person who's been doing this for years and we'd be like okay so you think that you can handle all that fine maybe you can maybe you can't you know you better than I know you but tell me this you say that you want to rescue them because you like the fact that we say it's fulfilling and yes it is but a majority of these creatures that we've spent a ton of time and a ton of money on are not gonna live that long because of what they went through before they came to us. They're not gonna live that long. They're gonna have a lot of pain. There's gonna be a lot of trauma involving us having to rush them to vets and hope they can be saved. Maybe they will, maybe they won't be. Sometimes you might get lucky and only one of them dies that year and sometimes half your herd will go down because it's just happens to be a crap year maybe they're all getting older at the same time just anything can happen depending on how many animals you have and can your heart handle that because you don't get used to it you get used to it in the sense of like oh yeah like emergency um intuition stuff everything kicks in better you are better equipped to handle it but that doesn't mean that you're just like oh that one died no big deal moving on like it still hurts those become your kids in a way with everything you do and on top of that just the process of the rescue i always told people who were still arguing and like dead set okay i want you to do a couple of things one thing is, if you think you can handle life on a rescue farm, I want you to come out on a day it's pouring rain, and I want you to come out on the hottest day of the year, and I want you to come out the coldest week of the year. And if you do just fine on all those days, and especially if one of them has a medical emergency, then you, you might be right, you might be ready. And I was absolutely not trying to deter these people from rescuing animals. I don't want anyone to, like, misunderstand me. I just wanted to make sure that they were truly ready before they ran off and made a mistake and accidentally made a worse situation for that animal because they weren't ready for it. And sometimes people manage. Like, sometimes they did okay. And they ended up, you know, enrolling in 4-H or something, learning about the animal and becoming 
great help for those animals and I was so happy when that would happen but other times they could barely last a day on the farm they didn't like the fact that they had to touch poop they didn't like the fact that they had to do all this extra work and they could barely even sit through a television show without going outside and I was like I told you it's hard and the other thing I tried to prepare them for was I was like Find shows like Pipples and Paroles. Find honest shows that depict how hard it is to actually rescue these animals. Because sometimes, yeah, they're just going to be running free in a field. There was a yearling bull at one point that was just running through our back forest. And we were like, where did that thing come from? And the freaking idiots that live behind us that were always drunk were trying to chase it down with a four-wheeler, which if you ever see a yearling bull free somewhere, do not chase it down with a four-wheeler. And we had to spend weeks in the freezing cold in the snow trying to track this thing down and calmly wrangle it to get it to safety. And it wasn't even our animal. We just didn't want it to die out there. Sometimes it's something like that, and other times, and this arguably was always the hardest type of rescue for me, a majority of the people that we rescued animals from were extremely abusive to those animals, and they had no idea they were being abusive. Not a clue. They thought that because they said they loved the animal and they weren't hitting it, that they were doing enough and one of these people it was kind of horrifying they had like a big big uh farm of animals they had cows they had llamas they had ponies they had like you name it they had it and all these animals were going through it it was horrifying we ended up rescuing two llamas and two donkeys from her and aiding in the rescue of two more donkeys all of the donkey's hooves were that tall and flipped upward and they could barely walk. The male was permanently lame in one leg as a result of this. It had been years since she'd even attempted to have a farrier out. And when we questioned her as to why, she was like, they get upset and kick when they have their feet done and I didn't want them to be upset. So you let one get permanently lame and you let the other ones grow out to the point where like she would just bite people. She was angry all the time and I am blame her. Once we got her feet down, which it took months to get them down to proper size, she completely changed. She was happy. She was running all over the place. She was having the time of her life and she's been sweet ever since. With the llamas, there was a trio. There was the baby, there was the dad, and there was the mother. The mother was perpetually pregnant. She was pregnant before the last baby was even fully weaned off of her milk yet. And it was because she thought the babies were cute. The baby came out all kinds of messed up. Somehow he's miraculously still alive at my parents' house and goofy as ever. I don't know how he made it this long. I'm glad he did though, but just things never quite developed right upstairs with him. The dad was 10 years old when we rescued him from this woman. She had never shorn him or done his feet in his life. And he was the only male that was impregnating the female for anybody who hasn't seen um llamas in prison before they have like the little camel type feet his were completely curled this way and like stuffed up inside the pads of his feet and his coat was so thick and matted it was like i'm not exaggerating it was like out to there it was horrible we were in shock when we saw the state that he was in and the mother was no better the mother went to a woman that we seriously trusted who'd had years of experience raising llamas and everything and she has a great life now the male came home with us and he was extremely aggressive extremely angry probably in a ton of pain 
we had vets overlook him. They said he'd suffered from numerous heat strokes because she'd never shorn him. And once again, when we questioned her about it, the same old excuse came up of, well, he doesn't like it. He gets upset and makes a lot of noise. I'm like, every llama well, I've ever met makes noise when they're getting shorn. They don't understand what you're doing. They're just going to be noisy. You have to just get over the fact that sometimes they won't like it. Like, are you never going to take your cat to the vet when it's sick, when it's dying because it doesn't like the vet? Hopefully not. Same with your dog. You have to treat them the same way. If your kid was crying saying, you know, daddy, my stomach hurts. I think I need to go to the doctor. Would you say, oh, but honey, when you, when you get your vaccine, you cry. So I don't want you to go to the doctor. Like that's what you sound like. It's ignorant and it's harmful. And like I said, a majority of the people we rescued these animals from were just like her. They didn't understand that they were being abusive because they just saw the animals on TV or saw them at county fair, thought they were cute, and liked the attention they got from them. And it was just horrible how many of them have gone through this. And we didn't just have llamas. We have a horse that went through crap like that. We had cows that went through crap like that. We had two ducks that like their whole story could take up its own entire video. But rounding back to the beginning of this video, listening to everything that was being said in that video about why they felt the need to put their dog down is the same kind of ignorance I heard from these people who were filling their land with these farm animals they had no business owning in the first place. And not only do I always want to make sure that people are rescuing animals for the right reason, especially if they're farm animals, like I said, anything unique that a lot of vets won't know how to help with if something goes wrong, but I think that the same logic needs to be applied for any animal. People, like, as a species, we've gotten so lazy with our pets where it's like, oh, if I have just a mutt dog or if I have just a regular American short hair cat, it's basically self-sufficient. I'll give it hugs and kisses. I'll give it some kibble and I'll give it some water each day and that's all it needs. And it's like, no, every dog, no matter the breed, has a certain set of needs that need to be met. Every cat, no matter the breed, has a certain set of needs that need to be met. It doesn't matter what the animal is. If you are going to be taking on the responsibility of caring for literally any kind of animal on the planet, you had better be sure that you can handle everything it comes with. Every need, every special food issue it has, every, you know mental type problem that it has anything you need to be ready for anything because I don't think it's right for anyone to think oh I'm getting this pet because it's easy there shouldn't be such a thing as an easy pet just like there's no such thing as an easy child everything has individual needs and you need to make sure that you can handle those and I saw a lot of people arguing that like Oh, it would have been even, you know, it would have been better off if instead of putting the dog down, they'd just given it away or something or taken it to a no-kill shelter. And it's like, yeah, but that shouldn't have even been an option. Like, that's not much better. It's like half a step above what these people actually did to that dog because animals, again, doesn't matter what kind, cats do it, birds do it, the llamas do it. Every animal I've ever rescued in my life has imprinted on me. They imprint on you. You become basically their parent. They care about you. They think you care about them and they rely on you. And if you think that there's anything in your life that could come between you and your care for that animal, then just don't adopt it. Leave it for someone who actually knows what they're doing. I feel like I'm just going to start getting legitimately angry if I get into much more detail on this. Just, you know, thing to take away from this video is just no matter what kind of 
animal you're thinking about rescuing, please make sure you're actually ready financially in terms of your living conditions, in terms of, you know, your mental and physical state. Make sure that animal has the best possible home it could because it deserves it just like you deserve it. And until next time, do something that makes you happy today, no matter what anyone else thinks about it, and I'll see all of you again soon.